y'all for being here with us today. We are back in the man cave, and we're blessed with the presence of Miss Raylan. Oh my gosh, I loved that music. Yes. I felt like I was in a honky tonk. I know that's the whole point. That's of the it. whole point. Could you see Patrick Swayze? Oh yeah. Did he come? Did he, do you envision yes, him in your and his, all of his glory? <laughs> I loved Dirty Dancing growing up. Yep. That was well, a great we movie. stole all this stuff from Roadhouse. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. That That's was great. Yeah. Makes but sense. I, my girlfriend in college loved Dirty Dancing too, and I hated that movie. Why did you hate the movie? Because she made me watch it over and over again. <clears throat> my favorite song is The Hungry Eyes. One look at you and I can't deny I've got. Did you ever have somebody try to do the lift with you? Yeah, and it did not look the yeah, same, man. Yeah, I've, that's I've a bunch of too. bullshit. Yeah, that's, that that's, was, that's exactly Patrick what Patrick was is. a badass. <laughs> yeah, he was. I think me and, me and Josh have a video. Because I was like, let's just do it. Let's just die. And then, let's like, just do it. It's, it was not the vibe. It did not look did, the same. Uh, did he fall? No, I fell. <laughs> like, I mean, I think he could have done it. I was just, I got insecure in my head and I didn't, you know, properly. You didn't hold you your actually, legs you got to plank. Hard, you have to plank. Way, you have to plank. Yeah. And I ain't a planker. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I'm not, that, that ain't me. Yeah. So uh, I didn't realize that you have to, like, give them the right support when you go up because it's just like, so if you if you look like uh, like cousin boneless, you ever see yep. a cow and uh, what is it, uh, cat dog? Yes. They had his, uh, cousin boneless. That was the chicken that had no bones that they just drape over everything. Cat, cat dog was a vibe. Cat I loved that. I loved that show. What other stuff did you watch? Growing up as a kid, <laughs> I, I watched the wild the wild thornberries. Remember those? Um, Beavis and Butthead. Beavis and Butthead. I remember that one. Or uh, Ed Head Ed Ed Nettie. Rugrats? Like that was Rugrats. Yeah. I wasn't really a big Rugrats fan. I liked the stupid shows like Ed, Ed, and Eddie. They didn't even make sense. Like uh, I watched SpongeBob SquarePants. I like SpongeBob. Lizzie McGuire, classic. Yeah. Uh, Hannah Montana, yeah. classic. Um, but like cartoons, I always liked just like the the stupid ones. You know that. It's hard for me to get past Bug Bunny, Bugs Bunny, and Roadrunner, and they. I think they've banned Pepe Le Pew. They did. Yeah. I love Pepe what? Le Pew. He was my favorite. The skunk that thought he was a cat that used to chase oh, yeah, a little kitty cat around. That's funny. Yeah, he Maybe was on Skunk Le Pew. And I liked, um, <laughs> I liked uh, oh my gosh, the cat and the mouse, Tom and Jerry. Oh, I love Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry, which is classic. That's just classic you know? stuff. Just classic stuff. Hey. My dad, me and my dad used to watch the Andy Griffith show. Oh, I still love it. And Andy it was so wholesome and so great. Like, he had all of the tapes. And um, I think he still does, but we used to watch it every night. I still watch it on the bus all the time. It's such. It's Sometimes just, you get up in the morning and it's like, do I want to really watch the news, no. or do I want to watch Mayberry? Yeah. Sometimes it's better just to watch Mayberry. I think so. I think the news is just the same BS over and over again. I don't trust so. any of them anymore. I don't trust nobody. No, it's gotten really I bad trust too. My dog, my husband, my Jesus, and that's about it. Tell so. me about the baby, <laughs> Daisy mm. Ray. She'll be two in September. I cannot oh. believe it. September. She was born September 8th, and um, she'll be. it really does fly by so fast. I feel like yesterday I was just in the hospital. It, and, and it's it like, and I don't even remember life before her. That's the craziest thing. It's like, how did you n never exist? Like, you were just perfect. Did you ever think you would have those motherly instincts like that? I think I did. Yeah. I always knew that. Yeah. I, I have so many nieces and nephews. I think together I have like 20 between wow. Josh's side and my, my, my family's side. Um, and so... Yeah, I mean, I've loved kids, and I've always wanted to be a mom, and so I knew that I knew that it would, you know, those motherly motherly instincts just kind of kick in. And I've been kind of like around. I've been a, my so my sister had Joey when I was eleven years old. Oh, so yeah. I've been around babies. I would, was babysitting at a young age, so that's why I've just always wanted babies. I think the biggest thing though is in our industry. You know, it's like, oh, you're a mom, so it's like that's going to slow your career down and all that bullshit. But honestly, it I don't hasn't. think you have to let any of that slow I, you down on any level I don't anymore. Think, I just don't think you just let it slow you down, like or I mean, let it affect you. I, nobody throw, should tell you how to live your damn life. And go on with it. Yeah, you know? and that's it's like it, people. Anybody that says that a child is a burden should literally just they can go shove it because it's just not true. I agree. Kids add so much joy to your life. And they, yes, it's hard, but like being an artist is hard. Pick your heart, you know? A lot of jobs are hard. A lot There's of a lot jobs of are hard. Are you make but, sacrifices and everything. But kids bring you so much joy and just like, it's just more time management that I'm learning now. It's like, okay, but it makes me more efficient with my time. So like when I go to a write, I'm like, hey, y'all, I have to leave by three because I have to get back to my baby. And it's like nobody's BSing and we're getting it done, writing a song or, 
you know, getting an interview done and, and I, I'm more scheduled with the way I live my life and I actually like it better. And the thing is, you got about three more years. Well, daycare will be coming up pretty soon. By the time you get uh, get to five and they get in kindergarten, that frees you up for the early yeah. parts of the day. You're going to be able to do a lot of it. I know. And we, we homeschool at ours a lot, too. I'm homeschooling Daisy for sure. That's yeah. done, done. Yeah. Done, done. I just Anna. don't trust the school systems. It's, it's a whole different world out there these days. And, too, I just... I just don't want my kid to be in school all day. Like, I want, I mean, I Does want her to learn. she sleep in the bed with you? No, she doesn't. That's she's, good. She's good. Yeah. She's good. You got to crate train them. Yeah, you got to crate train them. <laughs> um, hey, Allison, I agree with that. I mean, I can't wait till she gets older where, like, we tried to have her, like, come snuggle with us at night. We're like, oh, maybe she'll sleep. That girl's a wild banshee in bed. She is not, you know, she's, she thinks that she's playing when she's, you know, when we put her in bed with us. But she, you know, she goes into her own crib at night. She sleeps 12 hours a night. She's so great, um, 8 to 12 hours. But it's really great for us because it's like me and Josh have our time together at night to kind of decompress and stuff. But if she wanted to get in bed with us, I'd be – I mean, I want it to be feel like more of like a treat. But I never judge a mom like on what they're doing. It's like – Everybody's every, got their every, own thing. But every kid's different. Like every kid needs, you know, different things. But she's a, she's a hoot for sure. That's awesome. Well, congratulations Thank on that. You. Such Thank a you. great blessing in life. I, uh, uh, our housekeeper, she just had a new baby, and she just came back to work yesterday, and I got to hold the baby, little girl. Oh, oh my gosh, she's that melts you. Oh, uh, it's just, and I remember it's just like yesterday. Mine are twenty and twenty-two, mm. and it just it's it's gone by so fast. It does, and I mean, when I think about two years, like, and I I saw a picture of Daisy from a year ago. It popped up on my phone, and I was like. She looked so different. I mean, she's just gotten so big. And um, it's just, that's why, I think that's another reason why I want to homeschool. It's because I I was on and off homeschool growing up. And I, I did go to public school for a couple of years. But when I got diagnosed with diabetes um, at 11, and my family was traveling a lot for ministry, it was just kind of one of those things like, you know what, we're going to do school on the road. And I, I think that there's so much more life experience that she'll get being with us. And, of course, she's going to learn, and we're going to have a teacher and all those things. But being with her family and watching us work and watching us live out our dream, I think that that's going to be more beneficial for her than her just to be in a classroom that I don't know what they're teaching her yeah. for six hours a day, eight hours a day. And, you know, she's social as hell. She's around so many kids. I'm not worried about her. That was you know, I think it's a social thing. That was what I worried about the most. Yeah. Uh, when we took ours out of school, and they were in private school for several years, like up to the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. But we had a co-op of families. There was yep. like six families that left at the same time. One of them was a veterinarian. One of them was an English teacher. So we had kind of, my wife was a nurse in her previous life. So we kind of had this little co-op where they would go to one place, and they had this group of people together. My girls also danced on a competition dance team yeah. through the years. So they were around, they were socialized with kids every day. And I think that's the biggest thing that I was worried about was them not being socialized and just because mm -hmm. all the home the homeschool kids that I knew when I was growing up weird. were like weird as crap. Hey, but I was yeah. homeschooled and I ain't weird. And yeah, my husband was homeschooled. He's one of seven. How big a town did you grow up in? Uh, seventy thousand. It was, it was See, a I grew up town. in a town of about thousand people. Yeah, it's a weird. So, so group. it's it's like people that, <laughs> when they when they showed up the, to school sometimes they, you could smell the wood burning stove in their clothes. It's like people that were in, yeah. in, a, in a very impoverished, very rural part of yeah. the country. So you're talking about religious fanaticism, crazy stuff mm -hmm. too. So it's and and there is that I think that I think that stigma, the homeschooling stigma, is leaving too because people understand. Like, you think homeschool, oh, you're the weird kid yeah. that doesn't talk to anybody. No, it still does have those elements. <laughs> but first of all, there's people like that at regular school. Oh, I mean, absolutely. like, there's weirdos There's weirdos everywhere. You know what I mean? You like, go back and look at the breakfast clubs. There's yeah. some weird, weird characters <laughs> in the breakfast some weird, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But I, I just started, okay, I know Daisy is not even two yet, but I just signed her up for dance, and I'm so excited to be a dance mom. I think I'm more excited about being a dance mom than she is. She's going to be in ballet. I mean, I know she's, it's only 30 minutes once a week, but I was like, she needs, she's not in daycare. She's has friends and I just think it'll be good for her to do 30 minutes. And I know she's going to be a hell And she'll be cute in the little outfits too. Oh my yeah, God. I yeah, put her in her tutu and she like looked at herself and was like fixing her thing. <laughs> it was so cute. I remember my, my daughter, Skylar, uh, we had gone, I think we had gone to, to Longview, Texas. I was doing a Love charity Longview. show with Neil McCoy and we had, uh, we were out driving around and we'd stopped at some little dress shop and, and I bought her this little faux fur outfit with this little hood on. It looked like Shania's from the video. Yeah. And she would put it on and she'd go, I'm hot. 
<laughs> and I remember she was sitting in her car seat. Back then, when you turned on, on Broadway, the Nissan dealership was right there on the left mm -hmm. side of the road when you turned on Broadway. There was a red convertible 300ZX sitting on the showroom floor, and she's in her car seat in the back. And I remember dr turning and driving by, and she looked in the showroom window and went, wow. Wow. And I knew I was in trouble. Oh, hey, that's awesome. What are your daughter's names again? Skylar and Keegan. Skylar and Keegan. Those yep. are cute names. Yep. I love that. They're almost grown. I know. Gosh. So tell me about your children's book. Yes. So I was, was I eight months pregnant when I wrote? So I wrote a song called Raising Me a Country Girl. It was the last song I wrote before starting maternity leave. And I wrote it with Rhett Akins, my boy, yeah. and um, a guy named Will Bundy. Will Bundy's, an, I don't know if you've written with him. He's an incredible songwriter. He's a new guy in town. And uh, so me, Will, and Rhett, I mean, I'm eight months pregnant. I'm big as hell, and I'm tired. I have cankles. You know, like, my, my ankles were all swollen, and I'm just sitting there eating my, I think it was, I was eating a bunch of beef jerky at that point. I loved beef jerky. And um, anything with salt. And I uh, had my water, and we were just sitting there, and I was like, what is, like, what do, what's the last song I want to write before, you know, having this baby? And, you know, I was thinking about Daisy and thinking about just the kind of girl that I want her to be. Or I mean, I know she's going to be whatever she is going to be, but I just was like, what what do I hope for her? Um and I, and I was like, I hope for her to be a country girl. I hope for her to have good values and to know what's important in life and know that family is important. I hope that she loves her daddy. I hope that she gives boys hell. I hope that she plays in the dirt in her sundress and drinks out of the water hose like I did when it was hot because my mom didn't want us inside because we smelled too bad. Like, I, I hope that she has that life experience, you know, of just— of being of what it's like to actually be a kid, yeah. and I think I think that's lost nowadays. I don't think that a lot of kids get outside and um, actually have life experience anymore. And I mean, I I was the kind of kid that in the summer I'd wake up and I'd be gone all day. And oh came yeah, home that night. I mean, I don't even know what the hell I did. I don't even think I wore shoes all summer no, I went, I, until I went to church on Sunday. Yeah, it's like we we were just. I mean, I was a scraggly kid, and I just, we, that's the way we lived. And so, and it's, you know, times have changed. You can't do that now, unfortunately. But, you know, I was thinking of all those things. And so basically, I wrote all the things down from my childhood. And then we wrote a song called Raising Me a Country Girl. When we wrote this song, I was like, this would be the cutest children's book, just celebrating tough girls. And so it's, you know, it's right there. And I, this book has been selling so great and it's been doing great. And, and I love it too, because I've had mamas, um, that have sons and cause it's not just for girls too. Like they're like, I want, you know, them to look for them, a country girl, a sweet girl. And I want them to learn about that girls can be tough too. And so it's been really cool to see, um, moms with sons by the book too. And then one girl that messaged me on Instagram, she was like, I have four boys and I really want a daughter. So I bought this book to pray over because I want my own Daisy. Cause she loves the name Daisy, which is my daughter's name. So anyways, it's, it's been really fun. And I, um, I know this is going to kind of open another door for me. And, and I just, I want to write more children's books. I just think the next generation is who we should be pouring into. And I, I love it. Have you read it to her yet? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. She, I think she loves it. So uh, I know yeah. Kirk Cameron's been going around doing a lot of libraries and yeah. things. I, I think that's such a great thing. He's taken a lot of flack from the left over it, but he has stood his ground, and I yes. think it's been amazing what he's been achieving with this platform. I think it's just important to, to get out there, and I can't wait to read Raising Me a Country Girl and um, take it around and, and do some really cool things with it. I know we're thinking of some really creative opportunities. and Where else is it at right now? Um, it's just on it's just on uh, the website. I think it's RaylanBooks.com right now. Awesome. And then I think there's a few stores that are going to buy it in bulk to have in the stores. I know a few like Texas boutiques. And I think we might do like some cool um, stuff with – I'm doing a clothing brand collab with a brand called uh, Shop Buddy Love. And um, Buddy Love, we're doing like matching Mama and Me sweatshirts that say Raising Me a Country Girl and then Country Girl for the – did you do the illustrations too, or did you form that out? No, that was uh, that, that was through Brave Book. So they had a bunch of illustrators that are on their um, gotcha. on their team, and then the girl that did it, she just did such a phenomenal job. Did you uh, did you struggle with any postpartum after the baby? I I didn't. No, I I thought I would. I thought I would because uh, I've had friends that did. Um, especially like as a woman, it's like oh, like you know, there's just that. Am I, you know, just the BS of like, oh, 
I got to get back to the size I was. I got to get back to this or I got to get back on the road, like all the pressure. Um, But I think when I like, I never knew if I could have kids because I had type one diabetes. I was like, I don't even know if this is a possibility for me. Um, But when I was like holding Daisy, I could have given two shits about any of that. I was like, I don't want to be on the road again. I don't want, I literally just want to stay at home with this beautiful angel that I created. Like, how the hell can anybody like not love a child like this? Like, this is the craziest. I mean, I, I was so overwhelmed with emotion. I just, and I couldn't believe that I was a mother. Like, and, um, and, but I've had friends that have dealt with serious postpartum depression. It's a real thing. It's, it's, oh my God, it's a real thing. But I, I thankfully did not deal with that, you know, but I, I did pray a lot and I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know why I didn't deal with it, but thank you. Jesus, it's some, I didn't. some people just don't. I mean, my yeah. wife struggled with it a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, even, even the later stages. I mean, as the kids were getting a little bit older, sometimes it sneaks in on you, you know, and I it, think and it can, more, it can linger around several months after. Yeah. I think there was a point where. But this is not depression. But I was just like, I think I should get out of the house. Like, you know, I was like, yeah. I think we should go to like Target or Nordstrom <laughs> or something. Like, I don't know. Like, let's just retail like, therapy. Yeah, let's just retail <laughs> therapy. Yeah, therapy. And it's like you can't really do anything. And and you leave out of the house and you have so much shit. Like, you know, you bring so much and all they really need is a diaper and a boob. Like, that's all they need. And we're like freaking out about everything else. <laughs> yeah. And so I I was like, why are we? bringing all these creams and stuff like this, but it's your first baby. You know what I mean? My niece Ashton just had her first baby and my, my mother, God bless her, had six of us. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think we all put her through our own kind of hell in mm-hmm. our own kind of way. And my mother's like, you know, I've raised six, six kids. I think I've got this figured out. Well, they were going to the beach and, uh, uh, my mom was going with them and my sister and all the other kids and everything. My, my niece actually had, they had to drive their own vehicle cause they, they filled their, their SUV up with everything for the baby. They had to have all the things. Oh yeah. And so you're so overwhelmed as, as a first time parent. I know we were, we did all those things too. By the time the second one comes along, put some dirt on it. It'd be fine. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, once you get through that first one, you kind of realize that, you know, if you drop them, they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. Be fine. That was hard for me the first head. time that Daisy <laughs> fell off. Like, I didn't even want to talk about this at first. Cause I was like, Oh my God, I'm the worst mother. My baby fell off the bed, but thank you. Everybody's baby's falling off the bed. Yeah. And I still feel bad when I talk about it. Got to put pillows around. But like, yeah. <laughs> but like, this is when I didn't know that she was rolling. Yeah. And so when I tell you, I held her and I just weeped. Like I, and she was fine. She was crying. She was doing everything that you want her to do to know that she's okay. But I felt like the worst. Mother. I was like, oh my God, is she okay? Like I was like looking at her. I, I took her diaper off. I took all of her clothes off. I looked at her. I mean, like I felt so bad. It was, um, it was definitely interesting. And I mean, I fell off so much shit growing up I fell off a bunk bed and broke my nose like like it, I've done all the things oh yeah I was the fifth kid nobody gave a shit about me yeah, yeah just go go back outside yeah go back outside drink out of the water hose nobody cares <laughs> so where's uh, where's music at right now you back in the studio yes so yeah we're we're getting back in the studio I have a collab coming out soon who with, with a new artist named Jay Allen he's really hey. sweet um I've it's been Honestly, it's been a really cool season. I, uh, you know, I'm not signed to a label. I uh, own my own publishing now. Good. Uh, got new management. I've just been kind of beaten to my own drum. And I got a new agency, which if you don't know what an agent is, it's people that book you shows and stuff. And I kind of did like a clean sweep. And um, and it's just been, it's been cool to be in the driver's seat, the full-blown driver's seat of where my career is going. And there's just something different when you own your own shit. It's just like you protect it. You write better songs because somebody's not telling you, hey, write a song that sounds like this hit or write a song that sounds like this. It's like, no, I'm going to go in the studio and I'm going to write whatever the hell I want and see where it fits. Like, and because I feel like this industry, they really just put you in a box of what they feel like, what formula works. Well, as a label, if they've got five artists, they want to fit you into a category that doesn't overlap with something else that they're, yeah. they're working. They have their own agenda. Doesn't they have do anything have their to do own with agenda. You. And it's, and it, unfortunately, it's backed by a bunch of zeros. And if you're in the red and you aren't in the black, they look at you like a bank account. So it's like, okay, well, how much is Raylan in debt? Because that's, this will be based, this is how much we'll invest in her new single because she's already in debt this much. But what if you would invest a little more and you could take it to the next level? It's just, it's all, but listen, 
as a businesswoman, I understand that it's a business. Yes. We all want to make money. We, like, I no hard feelings. Like, it is what it is. But for me and, like, my creative process and me to be, like, in a good mindset, I enjoy doing my own shit. And I think there's two. We're in a time and, and place where there's so many uh, – resources and tools for us to market to our audience out there and i I think there's no matter what your platform is or what your sound is i think if you can just find a way to reach that target on target audience there's there's a million people out there that are going to love us if you just find a way to get to them absolutely and it's like how do you group them up how do you identify them how do you reach them is it through what platform of social media or or some political stance or whatever it is that you've got going on the hardest thing that i have to figure out because i haven't been on a label since 2007, 2006, something wow. like that. It's been a long time. That. Yeah, it's been years. Uh, I was on Universal for a short period of time mm-hmm. after after DreamWorks merged with them. But the last hit that I had, which was uh, Find Out Who Your Friends Are, was on my own imprint. Wow. So we've been doing this by ourselves for a long time. Uh, but there's just so many uh, ways to reach people out there. Uh, and and I, what I found out is that radio is too expensive to go to. A yeah. lot of people don't realize if you're not on a major label and you're trying to fund that yourself, you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to barely get in the top 40. And yes. nobody's going to hear you. And nobody's going to hear you. And and I think that's a, a big reason why they're signing a lot of this young talent is because it's everybody's dream to be on radio, yeah. right? It's everybody's dream to get a number one country radio hit. And um, I just think for me, you know, I've – God Made Girls, which was when I, when I was on Big Machine, because I, I came to Nashville, shit, was it 2012 I moved here? Or 2011 I came for the first time, but I moved officially in 2012. And my first label was Big Machine, Scott Bruschetta, that whole crew. Yeah. And um, and they got God Made Girls to top 15. Or I think it was, I think it made like 13 was the highest it got. Um, but it went platinum. I mean, it sold. It did everything that you want to. Because another thing, too, is just because, and you know this, just because you have a number one record doesn't mean your records sell. Absolutely not. Like, you can right. have a hit all day long, but that doesn't mean it's an impact song. Like, when I'm thinking of my business now, it's like, shit, I don't give a, f- like, I don't care about having a number one song. I care about having an impact single. Like, I want a song that's going to move shit for me. Yeah. Not just, like, because I've had f- we know a lot of artists that have had n- multiple number ones, but they can't fill out a damn arena. Absolutely. Nobody gives a shit about them. Yep. And it's like, that's, I think that's the difference between just a song and an artist and a star. And it's like, what are what are you doing to build your brand and like thinking of it in that lens? But, um, you know, God Made Girls did really great at radio. But I, I, I mean, I took several songs to radio after that. And it's just, I mean, it's just for the spend. I'm not saying, like, if, you know, if I want, I'm never going to say I'm never going to do something again because I feel like you never know in this world. But, I mean, to take, to spend a half a million dollars. And to give a third of everything you have. Yeah. To send your song to radio. And it's a chance that it might not go number one because there's so much politics behind all of it, too. It's like, oh, well, you know. This label, we'll give you this number one this week if we could have ours next week. I mean, there's all of it. But listen, that happens in every business. It's politicking. It's po- yeah. it, I get it. I understand it. It's awesome. But for me, like, in the place that I'm in, and I'm sure you're in the same place, like, I just want to grow my fan base. I want to do shows. I want to be where the fans are at. I could give two craps, like, about the business of it. I mean, of course, I, I want to know the business of it because I want to be educated. But, like... I do this for my fans, and I do this for the people listening to my music, and I got to get to them. So however, you know, whatever takes me there, that's what I want to follow. The hardest thing that I have to understand, uh, when you when you have a hit on the radio, there's a, there's a thing that happens that it's hard to describe to people that haven't experienced what it feels like. It's like, I call it the wave. You know, as you hit top 40, you start to feel a little rumbling. You hit top 30, it starts to move a little bit, and you can feel the intensity of the crowd mm-hmm. change. When you hit top 20, it gets a little bit more. Top 10, it gets it increases. By the time you get in the top five, when you peak out, if it's a real impact record, it changes people. There's something that happens when they hear that on the radio. And after spending, you know, 20-something years playing the chart game, when I uh, when I got away from that, it took me a while to decompress and realize that there's life after radio. Mm-hmm. But I still struggle to figure out how, how to identify 
uh, what's really impacting because things don't stay out there. They don't linger around very long on the social Songs. media platform song wise. Yeah. No, you know, I agree you put with stuff out and you might, it might go number one on iTunes. Uh, but do you, but what's I mean, how making long it stay and what's making it and how did I gauge it when I play it in the show? That's what I struggle with. And so I've just kind of started leaning on I things agree. that I feel, feel a little pulse from the crowd, but I, but I try to rotate things out and add things and even old things that weren't even single. Just try to feel that crowd impact because it's just, it's really hard to gauge without that because I experienced that radio wave like that. And and radio, I mean, at the end of the day, radio does help though. I mean, oh, radio. Absolutely. It, I mean, I think radio is is going out. You know, I I don't think it'll be here ten years from now. It, it, not it, in the might, shape form it, that it's it, in. I, Absolutely right. I think it will be in some ways because there's tons of flyover states that don't have Spotify and all that. Like, that's the thing is we want to think that everybody's on Spotify and Apple Music. stuff, But there's a lot of people that still don't stream music. Like, yeah. most of our crowd doesn't stream music. I mean, some of them do. But I think... You think that's a young, more young, younger demographic? Um, I think so. Yeah. If, I mean, but I'm definitely not. That's, that's just me, my opinion. But I think... A lot of these, you know, towns in the middle of nowhere. I don't know if I mean the old. I don't think the older crowds. Even, my dad don't know what the hell Spotify is. No, my dad I, doesn't like. I think that's. I definitely think that's more of a younger, the younger generation. Um, and my. But the thing is, is how do you take streams and put that into ticket sales? Absolutely. And how do you take that's that that's my that, point. That's the difference between like. You know, just listening to a song on a playlist and being invested in an artist. And it's like my, the thing that I'm working on now is like, how do I get people to buy what I'm putting out? Like, how do I get people to invest in my music and invest in my concert when I'm releasing a song? So that's, that's the place that I'm in because I'm not in a rush, but I'm like putting out a single every, like this year I put out Broken One. Uh, which is a song I wrote by my husband, my husband that's doing really great. So you're not trying to just constantly feed that freaking monster. Yeah, I mean, I'm time. I'm feeding it. Like, we did that one. Then we did, what else did we do to me? Raising Me a Country Girl, which is the song with about Daisy. Then I did a song called What's Wrong With That, which is so good. You would love talking about what, what's wrong with letting a man be a man. Um, and then, which is such a debacle these days. Um, <laughs> uh, what's what's wrong with that? And then I'm about to release the duet and then I'm going to release another song too this year. So I'm doing like four or five a year. Um, but I'm taking my time with this record because it's like, I I don't want to just put a record out to put a record out. I'm yeah. very calculated. I, I want it to be a body of work and maybe that's just me. I want to I want you to hit the top of the album and listen down to it and it's, go through a story. And that's the problem. I, you know, when when I was growing up, and you grew up in, in a little bit of a different generation, but when I was growing up, you you get attached to an artist and you, you anticipate and you wait for a year or two yes. years for that next album to come out. And you go to the music store. We'd go to Hastings in the mall. And oh. if you didn't catch it when the album was dropped, you, it might be two or three weeks before it got back in, uh -huh. before they restocked it. And when you put it in, you, you read everything on the packaging. You listen to it from top to bottom you went all the way down it i wanted to uh, take the journey of what the artist was trying to convey mm -hmm. because usually it was some personal message something they were going through in their yeah. personal life that's the way i've always tried to make records where it was pieced together they were they were in a certain place for a certain reason i wanted so many mid tempos a couple of up tempos a couple of waltzes yeah. the ballads and all the things that made a balanced album in my mind of the things that i grew up with mm -hmm. nowadays when a song's released it's just another song on a playlist on your phone yeah i don't think people have the passion about the music like they used to. I agree. But with you but on that. but then I look at the Swifties and what's going on with that and I, and it's I don't it confuses me. How how, how does that but happen? They're connected to her. Yeah. It's like that I think that's the I think that's the step that we've got to figure out or not even figure out. I mean, you know, one thing that I I recently said in a in a meeting a couple of days ago, it's like, you know, I'm a mom. This is my realistic life. Yeah. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm an artist. I'm a songwriter. And hell, now I'm an influencer because people want to know what the hell I'm wearing and all this bullshit. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but okay. I guess that comes with the platform. But I'm, you know, of course I'm going to write songs about having a good time. I still drink. I'm a fun mom or I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. Like, I still, I'm, of course I'm going to have those fun, rowdy country songs. But I'm also going to write songs about what it's like to stick it out in marriage, what it's like 
to be a mother and see your child grow up. I am going to write a song about, you know, the things that I'm going through because nobody, what's the one thing that makes me different from other country artists is nobody has had the life experience that I've had. And fans, most fans out there are moms, are wives, are living in a small town. They want to relate. And they want to relate. And it's like, instead of, me trying to be something I'm not, which I've done in the past, of like, oh, I just want to be this. Or like, instead of me doing that, I'm going to stick to what I'm good at. And that's, and honestly, me doing that and just changing my perspective in the last year and a half has brought me, I've grown my socials by another 100,000 followers this last year. And it's just been by me being unapologetically myself on Instagram. If it pisses you off, great. I don't give a shit. And me like focusing on what, is right in front of me and what my daily life looks like. And that's what's connecting me to fans. And I think that that's the missing piece for artists is they want to be something that they're not. And, you know, there's only one of you. And figure out what makes you different and find that and chase that. There's two There's two schools of thought here. Okay. And I think you're on the right track with exactly what you're doing. And I'm trying to do a lot more of that stuff too. But if you look back, to the artists that we idolized growing up, there was a mystique about those artists. Mm. There's a mystique about George Strait. There was a mystique about Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson because you never really knew everything that was going on in their lives. Mm. Nowadays, everything's just a freaking open right. book. But but I think we live in a society nowadays where they want to see the true you. They don't want to see the bunch of crap. They don't want to see the facade or the fake stuff about you. But there was something that real cool that used to happen. If you think about all the stories you heard about your artists, people that you idolized growing up, if, if they got in trouble on the road or something happened, by the time it worked its way through society, it became this thing, even if it was some minuscule. So now <laughs> nothing has time to fester and really develop into a real cool thing. You know, it's all, yeah. as soon as it happens, it's out there. It's just done. There used to be some great stories that you heard about all the artists on the road. I heard stories about Waylon Jennings almost getting busted by the feds in the studio and dumping cocaine down the <laughs> toilet. You know, there was all this crazy stuff that you hear about yeah. back in the day. Nowadays, something happens, it's just there. Yeah, it is. And I th I think there's a beauty to to it. And, 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 and like, social media is great, but it's also the devil at some points too. Like I, Absolutely. you know, and, and that's the thing for me. It's like, I want to find my balance. Like I don't want my whole life, like on vacation, I'm not going to video our whole freaking vacation. I don't like, post stuff from vacation. I, we don't do it because yeah. I don't want people to know where I'm at and yeah. when I'm gone. And it's like, what beach are you at? Well, it's like, bitch, quit asking me what beach I'm at. I don't want you to freak and I don't want to see you're everything at. you're eating every and, time you sit down at the like, freaking table. And the, but the, Listen, and I understand people figured out what beach I was at because it's very fi easy to figure out. Like, it's, you know, Miramar Beach. Cool, great, now you know. But, like, <laughs> I, but sometimes it's like, you know, it's just very, it is very, like, interesting. It's, it's to me, it's a love-hate relationship because I, first of all, safety is a big thing. Like, I, thankfully, I'm married to an amazing ex-Green Beret um, man who, like, would literally kick somebody's ass if they tried to come near me or my daughter. Um, and, you know, in a weird way, not if you're just a fan and you're sweet. Because um, I love seeing my fans out. And I love it when fans come up to me. Like, some artists, like, I think that they're weird. I, if you see me out, come say hi. Like, big hug. I love that. Um, but all that being said, you know, the world is just crazy. And so I've I've been trying to figure out, like, what's that balance with my daughter on social media? What's that balance with my life? Like, and so, and I'm still figuring out that balance. I have not. And I think that's a personal thing for everybody. Yeah. I, I think some people want to, uh, uh, like Alexandra Kay, love her to death. She posts every single day. She's doing stuff every day. She's yeah. become an influencer. But I, I think it's all different. There, I'm not comfortable with doing a lot of those things. Yeah, and, and that's okay. why I found this format to be able to, to reach my audience in a way that's comfortable to me because I'm not a guy that's going to detach from my life yes. to post on social media every freaking day. I'm yeah. not doing it. And also, too, finding people around you. Like, I have people that I've now pay to help me. You just, I'm I'm deleting my app this week or I'm deleting my app today. I'm going to send you stuff and you post it. Because it's just, it's not even just the, it's getting on Instagram. It's getting distracted because I am like, squirrel, squirrel. That's how I am. Like, I'll forget a million times what I'm trying to do. I feel so bad for my team because they're always, like, reminding me. Like, how oh, did you do this? I'm like, no. Um, sorry to me, my friends over there. I do it all the time, um, too. And it's just like. Sorry, Lindsay. 
But it, should, it is hard. But I think having people that, you know, can capitalize on those things and, you know, can do it for you, it's definitely money well spent. Absolutely. I'll it's lean just, on those folks. Oh, And they absolutely. keep all of it off of me. Yeah. It's a big part of it. Uh, yeah, I think it's great. And then, too, I just... Social media gets me down sometimes. I and it's I'm not a comparer though. Like some people I, I compared myself when I was like 18, 19, 20. Okay, whatever. But these, you know, girls on here, you know, looking hot as shit, like all this stuff. I'm filters. Like, good well, first of all, filters. <laughs> I'm like, good for you. Hell yeah, you look hot. You know, but I'm not I've never been somebody when I see that they have a nicer house, I'm comparing, or if I see that they are driving a new car, I'm comparing. You know why? Because when you become an adult, you're like, do you know how much that costs? Or do you know what that like like those are the things that my like my mind goes. And two, I've just thankful I'm thankful to Jesus for this, but like I've just always been an extremely grateful person. And I think if you you can either decide to live in a place of first of all, People that want more will always want more. When they have everything in the world and they have $10 million in their bank account or a million dollars or whatever, they're still, it's never going to be enough. So that's all mindset. Like freaking Kate Spade was, you know, literally sold her company for a billion dollars and then committed suicide the next day. Doesn't make sense. I think there's a conspiracy there. But um, (laughs) all that being said, but uh, that all that's to be said is nobody... Like, happiness is all about, you know, your mindset and what you believe is true. To me, true happiness is health, is, you know, my relationship with my husband, is my daughter, like, me being a good mother, like, me being present in her life, um, having a roof over your head. I mean, growing up, I thought if you had stairs in your house and you had an outdoor fridge, you were rich. And so at that point, I'm already rich, y'all. I have stairs and I have an outdoor fridge. <laughs> like, isn't it funny as a kid, the things that you think, yes. like, make people, like, oh, you have two fridges? Like, a fridge just for drinks? Like, but, like, <laughs> those are the things that, like, I think about. And, you know, I I've, I feel super blessed to be in a marriage where we, like, we just never, me and Josh have never been those kind of people. And I and I never will be that kind of person. And, too, it's like, I don't give a shit what I drive as long as it's, I mean, I drive a Tahoe right now. As long as it's big, I, I can't do cars because I feel like I'm in a go-kart. But I would drive an old 94 truck if that's what got me from point A to point B. I, I just, I'm not materialistic. I, I think I've learned a lot, too, as I've gotten older. There's something to be said about working through the hard times of a marriage and struggling. I mean, my wife mm-hmm. and I have been together almost 25 years. And in the music business, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of failed marriages. She had yeah. a failed marriage. It's not easy. It's not. It's not. And you have to dig in and make that commitment. We fought through some tough times. And kids can bring challenges as they Absolutely. get get older and they start coming into their own and they test you and they they divide and conquer because believe me kids are very manipulative and they're good at it they're very smart and they will drive a wedge in between you Mm -hmm. you got to stay on the same page Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's not easy when you're traveling all the time and you're and you're chasing a career and he's doing his thing I mean it's it's something that you have to really work at keeping those things together yep but at the end of the day when all this is gone right and because this is just fleeting it doesn't mean fleeting I mean like in you know, 40, 50 years, it's going to be me and Josh. When you're know? hobbling around on a walker with tennis on balls on the front legs. It's going to be a hot pink walker. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's going to be a damn I'm going to get a jazzy. It's I gonna, want an electric want a be- motor. Yeah, I want a bejeweled walker. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking like, I'm talking diamonds, bitch. I mean, I'm going to put all my money into my I want walker. a paintball gun, the one yeah. mounted on each arm that I can I shoot people shit. with. That's cool. That's <laughs> funny. I like that. That's it. That's sick. There, but you know, as I think, as you get older and you and and you settle into the reality, I I, I feel like I overcame a lot of it because I was very self indulgent and and probably not so nice at times. We know, all were. Early. But when when you're young and you're successful, you take a lot of stuff for granted. I've yeah. I've learned to appreciate it on the backside yes. as I've gotten yes. older, and you know, I've had to had to be humbled a couple of times and, and back up and realize that what was best for me was not the best thing for my yes. family and focus on my children and reprioritize some life at times. And sometimes that's really hard for a type A personality that has been so career driven for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's hard to back up and take a back seat, but sometimes you have to. Yeah. Yep. And I think I've had to, cause I'm very type A. I am like, I was the fifth child. I fighting for attention, fighting for attention, <laughs> proving something like i I mean, at I'll never forget my mom. We were trying to. 
I really wanted to do this like audition thing, and it was probably some scam audition now looking back, but it was some audition thing in New York. Um, or I wanted to go to some show in New York, and she said, if you can plan this whole trip for $1,500, we can go. Flights, everything included. I was 11, okay? I got on the phone. I negotiated a room rate. I negotiated our um, flights. I had everything lined out, and it was fourteen fifty. And she said, "You're going to do something incredible with your life." I don't know how the hell you just did that. And I would be on the phone, be like, "Yes, this is Kelly." Like, and I would act like I was my mother. And I literally planned this whole trip for as much money as she said that I could. And it's like, you know, there's something about that fifth kid, man. I always, I always say, I'm like, man, I hope that, you know, Daisy. I know Daisy can be a world changer in some way, but we've got to let her have some grit because you know you have something when you're. I mean, I. My mom, so my, my dad had four kids, and no, three kids in his first marriage. My mom had four in hers, and they came together and had me. So it was like kind of like the Brady Bunch. And so um, I had definitely a lot of siblings growing up. What was your first job? My first job. How old were you? Well, I worked at our church, our local church. I mean, my family had a church. And so, but I mean, I answered. So my dad is a tire man. So he has owned his own tire company since he was 23. He still owns a tire and trucking company in, Bay, or in Houston. So y'all go check him out. Tire Source. No, Truck Tire Depot. All right. On McCarty Road. You need something on your um, 18-wheeler. Go see go see Barry Woodward. That's a very honorable, respectful, yeah. hard work. Oh, hard work. Hard right? work. Hard work. And he still works just as hard. I've told him to take a break. Like, but he's, I mean, I think it keeps him. He probably young. run his fist through a center oh, block wall, can oh, he? Oh, yeah. If he's and, having tires all day. Oh, yeah. He's <laughs> doing all that stuff. He's just recently taken a step back, which I'm really proud of him. But, you know, I think there's something about that work. Like, he's just, he's also old school, man. He's like, dude, like, nobody's working harder than me. So it's like, but he's. He's finally found somebody kind of running the business, and he can, you know, do more and be yeah. granddad because he's going to come out and be with me a couple weekends this fall. But um, so I would answer phone calls for him. I would separate his receipts. This is back in the day when you had the white receipt, the yellow receipt, and the pink receipt. You oh, know what yeah. I mean? And so I'd flip them all. I'd, like, organize them. Every call I got to answer, I would put, like, a tally, you know, and every tally, I got a dollar, and I would I'd add a, a couple extras, and he'd be like, well, "Wait, what are those road calls?" I was like, "Oh, they were just like you know, co calls, or like somebody just called me, but they didn't really need anything." He's like, "Oh, so you count those too?" I was like, "Absolutely," but I, <laughs> I was lying, sack of shit. I just wanted extra <laughs> cash. Um, but no, so I, I worked there, and then my dad, you know, my brother had a co calling business, and I used to copy and paste emails for him. Um, but I mean, I was doing stuff at like ten or eleven. Like I was always helping and so you were very structural organized like uh clerical work and stuff you were very organized oh, yeah. at a young age oh yeah I love so you manage your own calendar and everything now oh yeah i mean i i do manage my calendar that's, now that's a lot to be said a lot of artists don't a lot of artists are flighty they don't know how to structure their lives well, at all. And, I do it, structure and it causes my, a lot of friction i do structure my life pretty well um i will say i mean i'm not perfect i forget things sometimes but i mean i'm pretty structured like, I have my routine of things, and especially being a parent, that'll make you have a routine. Yeah, sure. I think you have to. Admit, I, I used to fly by the seat of my pants and everything, and as I've gotten older, I've had to really work hard at structuring everything that I do. Because I, you know I can't remember it anymore because <laughs> I'm old. Routine's good. Yeah, it is. Routine's good, and that's one thing that I've been trying to— I need to get one of those whiteboard calendars for me and Josh because me and him need to be on the same page probably with our calendars. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing today? I'm like, oh, I'm doing this, this, and this. Or when are you going to be gone? What are we doing? And so, anyways, but. Are, are you structured with your songwriting? Like, do you have, like, a file cabinet of ideas and a folder of adverbs? Or, yeah, you know? so I, for me, like, I have, like, voice memos of, like, melodies I have. And then when I just get a random idea, I just pop it in my phone, uh -huh. uh, like, song song ideas. Um, but I get in inspiration from, like, everything, like, when it comes to songs. I I always just try to you know, flip a song on its head. Like, I want you to, like, for instance, when I wrote my song Love Triangle, I was like, okay, Love Triangle is like, you know, a person being in love with two different people, right? I'm like in this Love Triangle, whatever. But, you know, I was like, how do you flip this? And at the time, you know, my parents were, I was really dealing with the process of my parents' divorce, even though it happened when I was younger. It really didn't affect me until I got older. And so that's when I took that idea and made it about my parents' divorce. And so I, that's my favorite part about songwriting is, like, figuring out what's going to make it, this song, different, you know, and um, how can we spin this and, and make it, you know, something that's interesting. So I love my two favorite parts about 
what I do is songwriting and being on stage with the fans. Everything else in the middle can kiss my ass. Those two things are my favorite. Do you uh, do you find when uh, when you write songs that it, uh, it's kind of a purge that that for me, I, I don't write all the time. I gather up ideas, and then when I start writing, I kind of detach from other things. Yeah. And I seem to be in a better mood. It's like it's it's a release of a lot of things. Therapeutic. Almost like going through a, to a, a shrink. Oh, yeah. Uh, without having to pay $200 an hour. Yeah, no, I have I don't fully process something until I write about it. That's yeah. how I always, that's always and even And even purging all that, a lot of people don't understand. They hear songs. Everything might not be exactly accurate about what's going on in your life yeah. but you take the nuts and bolts of it and you and you take the theme and you craft the song and try to build the message out of it Absolutely. even if not all the details aren't exactly and the, true and this is the thing too is like because some people try to dissect every lyric or who's this song right about it's like bitch like i've been married for eight years i'm not getting my heart broken anymore like i get my heart broken in different ways because you know he freaking ate the piece of pizza that I was excited to eat. Like, like, it's like, that's what I get upset about now. You know, like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, on Broadway, like, you know, breaking hearts, you know, wearing tube tops and shit. I mean, maybe sometimes, but like, hi, but like, that's, you know, but I still want to write about that because that's what my fans are dealing with. And two, I'm an artist. Like, I think it's important to have those songs for your fans too. And I'm a songwriter and I love to, encapsulate a story and I mean I've written songs based on my friends experiences with dating oh, or exp- so it's like to me a great song is a great song and it doesn't have to fully relate to your story for it to be a hit or, or it can be it a work. mesh of two or three situations yes. of your life and yes. friends lives or something you saw on TV maybe maybe a Hallmark movie yes. <laughs> and something. I think, you never know and I think that like that's like when you just limit yourself to your story like I was like well my story doesn't match with everybody. And I'm not saying I'm not going to write about the things that are important to me, but that's not going to be everything that I write because first of all, and I would get bored. I love writing about different things. Oh, like, without a doubt. It's so much fun. Yeah. And I, like I said earlier, it's very therapeutic. It's such a release of, of a way to purge all that stuff yeah. out of you because things do build up. Oh yeah. I mean, I wrote a song recently and it's called bitch, which, um, God, I can't wait to hear that. It's so good. <laughs> it's talking about, okay, remember the song, um, Hmm. Remember the song by Brad Page? It's my favorite song. I was like, I'm going to miss her. She is yeah. home. And how it starts off kind of slow and then it gets fast. Like you, like it's like that hook. And so basically this song is the same vibe. It's like, you know, basically you're a beautiful, intelligent, too good for him, could do a lot better human. Like you're, you're, you're saying what bitch means, what he actually meant when he said that. But you know what? I'm just going to tell you what he has. He's a bitch like his daddy and his daddy was before him buying big, t- just like, and it's just super fun. It's like, you know, I'm not dealing with this or whatever, but everybody knows a bitch that, you know, drives big trucks and we know why he's buying a big, driving a big truck. He's overcompensating for something. Like, oh, we all know those kind of We've things. heard all this. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, but that doesn't necessarily relate to my life right now, but it's a hell of a fun song to sing. And I like, so that's the thing is I never want to limit myself. Like, and two, like, I grew up in a small town and we all know those, you know, like we all know those kind of dudes. So like, I think, I think it's fun as a songwriter because you just don't like, you just get to create stuff out of thin air and it, there's freedom. Make it, make it make sense. And there's know? freedom to, uh, not being on a label to not have to worry about trying to write to radio oh. uh, where you really have the freedom to just express yourself the way yeah. you want to. It's not like you're trying to chase a certain tempo or fit into a box of the label, what they yeah, want. I mean, absolutely. there's a lot of freedom to that right now. I remember the song, one song that I wrote years ago and I brought it to my label and I posted it on Instagram and it was blowing up. Like, and the hook of the song was breaking up with you was like taking my bra off. Like, thank you, Jesus your our relationship is over and and that is not a label song like they, i mean of course i remember playing it for them and i'm like oh my god isn't this like great and then they were like they're like but they knew because they know the system we love this song personally like we think it's great but this ain't gonna work you know for what we're doing and so like when i left the label and i released baytown which got over a hundred million streams my first independent project it was because of songs like Bra Off. Like, it was because of songs like Keep Up. It were songs that, you know, tested the line and you, what didn't quite fit in that box, you know? Do you still think the uh, the music industry on some level is still a little misogynistic? Um, 
What do you mean? Is it getting better? A male-dominated, um, the male hierarchy that runs a lot of these labels don't want to hear that type of song. They want you to be sexy and fit into this other oh, box. Oh, for and, sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's all still very real in oh, this business. Oh, yeah. yeah. And especially, and, and goes back to your point, the labels mm -hmm. say they love it, but we can't take that to radio. Yeah. Because the people that program those stations. They don't relate, but they don't relate to that. But who's listening to their stations? Moms. Do you, th I don't think, I don't, I wonder Women. how much much the programmers really pay attention to their audience anymore. They've almost detached. Everything is pre-programmed. I don't yeah. think they listen to their listeners well, and their markets as much as they used to. It's sad because radio used to be, like, if you were a radio jock, right, like, you determined. You took calls. You took calls and you were like, what do you want to hear? But now you have four big dudes that control everything 30 stations, 40 stations, 100 stations, 200 stations. So there's really no, like, listening to what each town wants to hear or what like market wants to hear it's kind of a one size fits all and i think that that's unfortunate because i think every area has different wants and needs and likes and like if you are in a flyover state that you know they are you know maybe an older a little bit more conservative a little bit more conservative yeah. a little more of an older generation you know they're not going to want to hear certain new you know bro country type songs, which I love all kinds of country music. They're going to want to hear more of the old school stuff. So it's like, you know, you're taking that away from them, but that's what their city wants and needs. So I think I, I do miss the old small town radio feel because it really... Because it, it really reflected of that market yes, and what those people yes. wanted. And then people that were artists needed those markets. You know what I'm saying? Like if you were an artist that was hot back then... You could go still to those markets because that's what they wanted to hear. And you could you could uh, kind of get traction on that record by getting some of those stations early on in those markets yeah. that really understood who you are. You're going. This is going to blow your mind. I was I was one of the last radio tours I was on. I'd gone, and I'm not even going to say where the city was, but I'd gone into the booth and I was doing an interview with a guy, and he said, "Lee, what, what kind of stuff you want to play?" And we talked about some songs, played a couple of things, and then I'd said, "Play this song," and it was a number one record. Somebody in another part of the building that was monitoring that, that had the control over that, when I asked him to play that certain song, they changed it before he played it and put a different song of mine in its place. With me sitting in the studio. Wow. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Hmm. And then that, that's, that's how much control they have over these stations. Yeah. It's crazy. And I think a lot of fans don't know that. No, and they I don't think have that any that's idea. why, see, that's another reason why I love streaming, because you can just stream the shit you love, which is there's something to that. Yeah. And then how do you find new stuff? That That's the issue. That's how do you thing. find new stuff? Yeah. It's, it's the like, same with podcasts. How do you find great podcasts? How do you find great new music? And and Spotify does a pretty good job of giving you do. new boots and new things. And yep. I try to go down those rabbit holes and, yep. and listen to a lot of new stuff that's out. But uh, you hear great songs from somebody. Somebody cut a really great record and you never hear anything from them again. Yeah. And it's like. I mean, there's so many records that I'm still finding. I'm like, how the hell did I not find this? Like, oh my gosh! You know, and I, I, and I, I actually listen through and think, I, if I find something I like, I might just cut it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, the one thing that I want to get back to doing is getting back on the road, growing my touring side. Because I mean, when you have that underground road family that just are there for you and they want to see you play, it just organically grows. And so yeah. it's like that's kind of been what I'm focusing on and. And putting together a, a sick project that, you know. You know, you almost it. wish, I mean, you don't want negativity coming on you, but, you know, just look at the thing that just happened with Jason Aldean. They took yeah. advantage of it. They capitalized on it, even though CMT did something really stupid and booted him, booted the video off. Yeah. You almost want something like that to happen to create controversy because it gives you a platform in the marketplace and brings your visibility up. Isn't it so sad that we have to, like, do it's that, ridiculous. though? It's, it's yeah. ridiculous, but... You know, and I know he didn't press. do that on pur no, purpose. No, he didn't. But yeah. you look at a company like CMT, and how do they even carry any leverage at all when they only play videos on Sunday morning? I mean, you never see yeah. any videos. They used to be I, when I came to town. That's all they played videos all day, every day. It was so cool. I remember. I loved it. I remember I uh, it. watching CMT when I would get back home from school, get back off, you know, and that's when I recently like found out about Miranda. So Miranda Lambert was the first record that I bought with my own money. And um, they were playing her song, Me and Charlie Talking, which is, you know, that's old school, yeah. first record of Miranda. She was this beautiful blonde girl, you know, with her tank top and boot cut jeans. And um, 
Mama Tried shirt, and I just loved that was because that was her first single. Because they probably probably put me and Charlie talking out before Kerosene because it was a little more like, you know, chill, right? And then they came in with the fire and hell and all that stuff, which is cool. But um, all that being said, like I remember watching CMT and I watching Jason's first song Hick Town on there and like getting like so jacked about like just watching country music all day. It's uh it was a it was a it was such a it was such a cool time. That was back when uh it was really cool too. I think at the awards Blake did like a throwback of uh the old school CMT um look. Remember like with yeah. the the old school stuff? But no it's you know I, I think you know, I always, I go back and forth with it. With video, per se? Or? No, with with just um, controversy and all that kind of stuff. Like, I, by the way, that's my ADD catching in because I'm just like, squirrel, n- next thing. No, but I, I do think it's important to, you know, you know, people always like, shut up and sing or, you know, keep your, you know, don't make yourself political or whatever. But I don't think it should be political- now it's political to just believe in what's right and what's truthful. Yeah. And and I think that's the part for me that um, the thing that I will never back down on is it's like my husband is a Green Beret. My brother's a Green Beret. Like the military is something that is so important to me. Um, being a patriot is important to me. I mean, I don't even think that like I feel like both sides have things that we should grow on. You know what I mean? Like, but I, you know, I'm unapologetically pro-life. I mean, my mom almost aborted me as a kid. And it's like, you know, because she was in a really difficult position. So it's just like, I, there's things like, and, and a part of me like, is like, oh, I, I shouldn't talk about that. But then I'm like, what if my story changes somebody's life and changes somebody's perspective on something, you know? And, and I, I, I battle with that. Cause it's like, I do believe in focusing on just music, but then I do believe that God gives you a platform for a reason. And we have a lot of fans out there that, you know, feel alone and they're not alone. And I think that they're, it's important to speak to them. You know, yeah, that's just my opinion. I, I try real hard not to express my political views from the state. Sometimes it comes out, but I, it's not something that I do on a regular basis. Yeah, but I do have a voice, and I do have things that I have my passionate Absolutely. about. Uh, and that's and, o- and that's okay. It, it is okay, yeah. and I think there's a time and place for everything. But that it, it just depends on who you are. You know, I respect yes. John Rich so much. John's yeah. very vocal and out in front of everything. Yeah. but and John's not you, and John's not me. Everybody Absolutely. has. Like, I feel like there's some, there are some hills that I will die on. There were some things I'm going to hang my hat on. But I'm on. not willing to fight all the time. Yeah, for but that's all not my battle it. to fight. Like, no. not every, I think God, God gives you a conviction about what you need to talk about. And, and everybody else has their things that they should talk about. And I think I have my few things that, that are on my heart, unapologetically on my heart, that I will speak about. Then I have some, I'm just like, you know what? I'll leave that person to let them fix that battle. And, and I can't fix everything. I'm, I'm focused on so many different things right now, and I believe we do need to spread more love and more, like, like we need to just love people. And I think that that's a big thing that's lost is, but the thing is, is there's, there's love and truth. And I think people have separated that, but like there's, or truth and love. Like I, you know, just because you might believe differently than me, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't step in front of you if a gun was coming your way. Like I I have so many friends that don't agree with me on certain things. Absolutely. But they are my friends. But like, it's you, just the divide of it. You know, and I, I, I've i really had to detach. After after the Trump debacle in 2020, huh. I really had to step away from the news for a while because I was really devastated by it because I thought our country was getting back on track and there was a lot of the, the, the whole machine was working against him. And I really had to detach. Yeah. And, and because I, I realized that the media... Uh, the news and a lot of things around us are are actively trying to divide us, yeah, racially, politically, socially, and and I had to step back and remember that you know 
I think we have a lot more in common than we have that divides us. And we're allowing too many people to influence our thought. Because when it comes down to it, most people really just want to have a better life and give their kids better opportunities than what they had when they were growing up. They want a safe society. Uh, And uh, there's so many things that are breaking down the fabric of our society right now. And that's what I struggle with. That's what I hate. And and that's why I don't watch any of that stuff. I focus on my neighbors. I focus on my friends. People that matter that I focus on the people with. around with me. I'm not, I think one of my favorite things was it Denzel Washington that said, was it Denzel that said this? Yeah, Denzel said this. He said, you know, before, he was talking about social media. And he said, before you would have like 10 or 15 people, and I'm going to find this clip and send it to you, 10 or 15 people in your circle that you were trying to impress, right? Like those are the people you cared about having conversations with. Those are the people that you cared about what they think, you know. But now, social media like the t- you had ten or fifty people that you that you needed to like you right, but now you have for me seven over seven hundred thousand people that I have to make agree with me. Impossible. That is absolutely impossible. Yeah. Like, and so I think the only way we're gonna find and and, and I'm not. This is the thing too. It's I'm not trying to shove the way that I believe down your throat to make you believe that. I just think it's important for all of us to have conversations and have empathy for each and other. Not just, We've lost empathy. And for, not just fly off the handle when somebody disagrees. Yeah. With you. Can't we agree to disagree? Absolutely. And and quit the knee-jerk reactions yeah. when you get one negative comment if you're a corporation and somebody gives you a neg- negative comment and all of a sudden you just go through this whole withdrawal yeah. of everything. You know, let's... let's yeah, I maybe mean, people told me to quit bit. music because I suck at songwriting and singing. <laughs> I mean, what if... What if I did that, damn it? Like, I mean, I'll okay, never forget when I was on The Voice, somebody, you know, and when I was on The Voice, I was not as great as a singer as I am now. Like, I was like, wake up, cow. Like, I said, like, <laughs> I sounded like I said cow when I said call. And, like, all this shit. And so on Twitter, people would be like, you know, make fun of my voice. And Blake would retweet it. And this was when he loved retweeting and blowing up people. And he'd be like, hey, chicken shit on your grand and your grandmother's closet or whatever, like in your you know corner, like you quit talking about my girl this way. And it was just super funny. But it's like, we all deal with stuff like that. We all, you're going to get some feedback. Like, it's just, I think that, you know. But I don't need moving. a safe room to cry it out. Yes, over. yes, yes. <laughs> and so, but all that being said, I I think when my prayer for this country is that we can all have a little bit more empathy for each other. I think what we're lacking is empathy for, like, you can believe differently than me. That is totally fine. And I, you know what? It would be really, I'm sure, even somebody that I absolutely dislike, I'm sure there is something in their past, in their present, something in their life that I can relate to and find something to love about them. And and I actually, I know I could. Like, I could find, I could talk to the wall, though. But all that being said, like, we, we have, we've lost that. And I, personally now, I just, I focus on what's right ahead of me. I focus on who's around me. I do have hard conversations with some people, but I only have those conversations with people that I care about and that I love that know my heart. Because how do you have a conversation with somebody that actually truly doesn't know you and know where you're coming from? Because... I truly do love everybody. I have a I have a heart for people and I love to understand people's stories. I love to understand why people believe certain ways. I'm an open book and like I can talk to you about anything. I enjoy having conversations. I do too with somebody that's a reasonable person. Yes, that, yes. That and, you can have a reasonable But you can't have a conversation. But but there are those people out there, but People don't want you to think that they're out there, but there are. Like, yeah. you know, the, you have, like, the, but the best thing that we can do is just have those conversations and find those people. And you can't find them online. You can't find them, you know, on the news. Like, you just got to have your own sphere. And I think that that's what they're scared about is us to actually talk. Um, they want you to stay on your phones. They want you to stay on social media, stay on TikTok, because that's how they that's how they get you to be so 
upset about it. You know, one of the things we focused on uh, in the last few years is really taking the kids abroad. And, yep. you know, if you watch the news, you think the whole world's in chaos. Yeah. But there are good people everywhere. everywhere. If you go if you go and you try to experience other cultures, and I tell the kids this when we travel, don't bring your American ideology with us. No. Because it's not the same around the world. Yes. When in so Rome, cool. do as the Romans do. Go experience the food and the culture. At least try it. If you don't like yeah. it, you don't have to do it again. Yeah. But we found some That's amazing so cool. people as we travel that would welcome welcome us into their homes and, absolutely you know just and and food is such a common ground when you travel yeah. i love experiencing food and i met great people in in italy that own little cafes and things yeah. where you just get to know their family history and places they're owned by five generations and yes, take you in part so of the cool. restaurant and tell you where his great grandmother slept this was my great grandmother's room and my brother works in the kitchen and it's just cool experiencing those things we've we've lost track of of, of experiencing humanity and, and yeah. getting connected with people of other yeah. cultures and hearing their faces. stories. And, and really yep. being interested in it and enjoying yep. the journey. I find that all very fascinating. Oh, I, I love that stuff. Me and my, I told Josh, I want to go to Greece so bad. Like Athens, like Absolutely. that whole area. I think we're going to go for our 10 year because we've been married for eight years. So in a couple years, I want to go to Greece because I just, First of all, I love Greek food. I love feta. I love everything about Greek food. And, and Greek I, mythology. Greek mythology. I know. And he loves all that stuff. Like, so I want to go to like the Colosseums. Like, I think that would be our our big trip because I I I'm the foodie, but he would love all the Colosseums, and I love history. Yeah. Um, so I think that that would be super fun. No, but I I love that. I that's one thing I love about traveling too and finding and playing small towns. It's like, okay, what's the coffee shop in this town or what's the restaurant? Like I don't want to go to like Texas Roadhouse or whatever. like what's the restaurant that everybody goes to in this little town? I love doing that and finding the greasy spoon. Yes. yes. Uh. All of that. Something things. that the griddle's been in the in that restaurant for fifty years. <laughs> Hamburgers don't taste any better than from those places. Oh, oh yeah, it's amazing to me. Oh my gosh, it's just they don't probably clean the grill, but that's why it tastes so damn that's good. That's why it tastes man. so good. That's okay, so we we talked about this before. I'm sharing this with everybody. I just got a new tattoo. My buddy Travis Harper out in Idaho so did sick. this. So this is my uh, my country music rep, Mount Rushmore, and it's got <laughs> George Strait, George Jones, Keith Whitley, and Merle Haggard. What would be your country Mount Rushmore? That's a great question. Oh my gosh. Well, let me look at my arm. Well, I have a cowboy boot that I got six tequila shots in at Hardy's wedding. So, um, <laughs> God bless you. I remember on the way back, I was like, damn, my arm hurts. And Josh goes, yeah, you freaking got a tattoo, babe. And I was like, oh, sorry. Um, I would probably have, I'm looking, I'm just trying to envision it. Dolly Parton for sure. Yeah. You know, Dolly Parton. I think George Strait would be on there. Yeah. I love, love Daddy George. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Would Blake be there? Blake. I just don't know if I want him on my arm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love him. Um, he's a lot. He's a lot. I mean, you know what? We'll put Blake. I mean, we'll I put like, him somewhere else. I'll put. <laughs> I have him sign the bottom of it. I'm just kidding. You know, you know what? I'll put Blake on my arm. I'm just kidding. Um, he always like laughs at the deer tracks on his arm because he says they look like ladybugs. And then who would my fourth one be? Probably Reba McIntyre. I love Reba. Um, I don't know. That's hard. I That's a tough out. question. I know. Maybe I'll have to get back to you on that one. I don't know. I love. So who were who so were many. who were your go to artists? Say when you were fifteen years old. Who who are the three four people that you listen to all the time? Uh, for sure, Miranda, George Strait. I loved. Um, I listened to Blake a lot. Um, Shania Twain. Did you ever go back into old Patsy Cline? Oh, I, yeah. Oh, we, we grew up listening on Patsy. So yeah. Patsy was like around our house. Yeah. Like, um, old Patsy. Any groups, you know? Any. Of the Judds, maybe? Oh, oh, duh, the Judds. I'm trying to think. I mean, the list is long. I mean, if you're a country the, music. The, the Judds, Lone Star, I loved. Um, I mean, of course you, duh. 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 That's like a given. Um, I'm Patty Loveless, maybe? Patty Loveless, yes. yep. Pam Tillis. I love Pam. Um, I'm trying to think. I love Travis Tritt. Um, I I mean, I I just grew up on all that music. Yeah. Like, it's just, we we were always listening to it. I mean, I definitely was like a little bit of Taylor Swift growing up, like old Taylor. First couple records. Um, How do you feel about the, the journey that she's made popping into the pop world? I mean, she's she's probably the biggest star on the planet right now. 
you know, we, we touched on Taylor a little bit while ago. You know, I, I love Lady Gaga, too, and she had her little monsters and things. So that's kind of the th same thing that Taylor's done. She's named them, and she's grouped them together, and she feeds that whole machine into that mindset. But it's yeah. been amazing how huge she is. I mean, to do three and four nights in football stadiums is— I mean, that's—it's it's, it's unbelievable. Amazing. It really is unbelievable. I think the, the thing about her is she just— First of all, she has the, her fans in the palm of her hand. She could sing the ABCs, and they would love it, you know. But I think the thing for her is she's always put the fans first. Yeah. And I think that's the importance. Like, she would do long meet and greets. You would hear all these stories, like, and I think that there's something. When you when you give the fan that experience, it's something that they will never forget. And, you know, I try to do – that's why I try to do and – I, and I don't do it just to – do it. I do it because I want to do it. I want to, first of all, if I'm away from my kid and I'm in this town and I have 150 people at a meet and greet that want to meet me, what does it take for me to spend 45 minutes and go greet every single one of them and tell them for thank you for coming, signing their thing and hugging them? Like, that's going to make their life. And I think when I was younger, I, I had a different mindset. I was like, oh, I'm tired or whatever. But it's like I only get this moment one time, and I'm not going to be in this town again. And, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's different. Like there's been times where I've been sick or whatever. Or, but, like, I, I think we've lost that, you know, fans love that. They love that moment, and they don't get that moment very often. And And so I think that that's when she really – you know, she's always put her fans first. And when you do that, they'll love you forever. Yeah. And um, and writing stuff for them and listening to them when they love a song. And um, there's something to that. So, I mean, that's, I think that that's one thing that I want to, like, what we were talking about this earlier is, like, finding who are your fans, how can I connect with you, and, like, you know, what can I do to... And do that as long as you can. I mean, it, I mean, by the time I get done on my show, I can't. I'm, I'm You're done. beat. I'm yeah. done. But I signed autographs for years yes. and years. I mean, I you would... You put the work in, and I think... But, that, you, but you do those things when yeah. you're young. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And just like the guys from Alabama, I, I mean, I know Randy and those guys would go sign every night for years, but he don't do it anymore. Yeah, or or at least make a time to sign, or at least make yeah. a time to figure something out. You know what I, I mean? I pre-sign a lot of stuff Yeah, nowadays. and now, like, because not every time do you get those chances, and sometimes, like, there'll be a weird person that ruins it for everybody, like somebody that might be unsafe. There's some crazy there people out there. There are some crazy people. We had somebody recently that got, like, said that he was my family, because it was a show that most of my family was at. And why the hell nobody asked me, you know, but there, I did have a lot of family at that show. So they just assumed. And he was like, said he was my family. And like, this guy was like, Hey, you know, this guy I was like, absolutely not. And he was a weirdo creep. And like, so they walked him to his car. They had security. I mean, they handled it the right way, but it's just like, people were freaking weird. Is that, what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you with a fan? <sighs> wow. I have a few. Um, this one guy, well, you know, festivals. You see all kinds of kinds of festivals. This guy walked up. So I don't take photos with anybody that's wearing, like, a Speedo anymore. Like, if you're wearing a Speedo. <laughs> that's a good rule. Okay, of thumb. so it's like, you at least have to have pants on. Or, like, <laughs> pants or, like, and you can't have. Rule like, number one, must have must pants Must have pants. On. But, like, we were playing this in, like, bum F nowhere. Okay? Like, I don't even know where we were. And, you know, when you're. A pretty girl, you know, some guys like, you know, I'm married. I'm not going to kiss you on the cheek unless you're like a little boy, okay? And and and, and don't like, yeah, unless you're a, a kid, I'm not going to kiss you on the cheek and I'm not going to let you pick me up. Like, I'm not 18 anymore. Like, oh my God, I'm not, like, no, like, I'm married. I have standards for myself. And two, I don't want parameters, some, please. Yes. And I don't want some random dude picking me up and touching my, like, no, like, I want, I'm already taking a photo with you and I'm already the nice, I'm a very nice person, okay? Don't breathe your drunk ass yes. breath on me. Yes, and so this guy walks up in an American flag Speedo, okay? So just get the visuals. It sounds like the naked the, cowboy. All the tattoos on his chest, you know, American flag um, hat. And he goes, um, he comes up to me and he goes, can I pick you up for the photo? And I said, I was like, no, like, I, I don't do that. Like, you know, but but I'll take a photo with you. He goes, I knew you were effing bitch. And I said, excuse me? 
And he was like, you bitch won't let me pick you up. And he just started talking on his breath. And I said, hey, y'all can get his Speedo ass out of here because I'm not taking a picture with this drunk asshole. And I, like, was done. And, like, my tour manager at the time took him, whatever. And it's just like, dude, like, first of all, I'm already uncomfortable taking a photo with the dude practically, like, you're practically with this junk hanging out. Yeah, it's yeah. disgusting, okay? And then you want me to let you pick me up when you are sweaty and gross. I don't even want you next to me. <laughs> and you want me to let you pick me up? Like, like absolutely not. Um, and then this one guy, okay, Fanfare. Ha! There's some funny ones at Fanfare. So he had a face shirt of mine on, but... He was also like five one. I'm just no five. Okay, so I'm five one. He was like two inches taller than me, so maybe like five three. He was not that. He was very short, and he had, you know, like I said, my face shirt on. My whole face was like like his pants were like up to the middle of his like stomach, so all you could see were my eyes and my nose. Okay, and the Creepy. shirt. Creepy. Um, but he liked to tuck the shirts in. You know, he liked to tuck the shirts in. The tucker. He comes. He comes in. <laughs> he comes in, and he target. Yeah. He, <laughs> he comes in. That, that was funny. <laughs> yeah, but he comes in and looks at me, and and also he was already a weird fan. He creeped out Lauren Elena, Daniel Brabert. Like there's a bunch of artists, girl artists. He was just really weird, and so. He comes over, and I'm like, oh, God, here's the weird dude, but it's okay. Like, he probably just going to be sweet. I go to give him a hug, and he kisses me right on the lips. Right on the lips. And I was just like, and I said, what the, like, what the fuck? Like, what, did you just, no. I was like, no. And I, like, literally was just like. What? And then I looked, and my manager was livid. I mean, like, so mad. She grabbed his arm. She's like, you were out of Fan Fest. You were blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, and he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to kiss you. I just haven't, I haven't seen you in so long, and I was just so excited to see you. And I was like, get your crazy ass away from me. And it's just like, I think the thing is, is it's just like, I, I've i always been a fan, and I've been excited to meet artists, but this whole, like, thinking you can throw things at them when they're on stage you can kiss them on their lips you can grab them on their rear grab them on their yeah grab them on their ass or pick them up like you have to be just respectful of people like just because There's, somebody is a fan and you're a fan of them doesn't mean you have to cross a line personal space yes i mean yes. And we all deal with it and people lose their freaking mind uh, and, and i understand and, and, and but that's there that's like i don't know just be it's, normal just, just be and i understand it to an extent i mean i've met when i met dolly i uncontrollably cried and I don't even know if I cried that much on my wedding day like I'm just being honest like I was a wreck when I saw da Dolly like I, I couldn't help myself but you know I also was like trying to keep it together I was trying to show her I was keeping it together you know what I mean so it's just but there's a difference between crying and like kissing somebody and wanting you to pick them up when you're in a sweaty speedo you know like you have all this my things. grandmother attacked George Strait oh I was so embarrassed. She literally jumped on him and almost tackled him. It was my grandmother. But that's kind of cute. <laughs> but she also can get away with it because it's your grandmother. Yeah, I was still so embarrassed. Yeah. I have some embarrassing <laughs> stories like that, but we'll talk about those on another day. Because I I mean, I had my crazy Louisiana uncle at my wedding go up to Gwen Stefani, and I wanted to throw up. I got so nervous. And I'm not going to say what uncle was because, you know, I don't want to offend him or anything. But <laughs> they were all probably drunk. I don't even remember what they did. But I was so stressed. I was like, please do not. Oh, my God. Am I, uh. And I was just like, you know, you can see it from far away. And you're like, all right. The, yep. Uh, it's happening. Okay. There's nothing we can do about that. But So do you, does your family have family reunions? Do you all all get together? So my, my dad's family gets together a, a lot. Because we all have those weird people in our families. Oh, oh that's hell scary. yeah. That the you just that you never know hide. what they're going to do. You it's never like, know where they're going to come. You never know what show they're going to come to. And you're like, oh, shit, Uncle, what's my calls here? Like, <laughs> and it's like you don't want to act like that's your your family, and you're just like, doot, doot. But you know what? We all have them. We all have that we shit. Have like, them. nobody. I mean, it's so funny. It's like I've been with some of the coolest people, <laughs> the coolest people in the world, and then, like, and, like, you know, but every big old star has a big old weirdo in their family, and there is nothing you can do about it. It doesn't matter cousin how Eddie. cool you are. There's always a cousin Eddie. It is so true. We've all and, got him. Oh, we do. And I think, 
I think that's what makes it awesome about what you do. Like, you know, well, shit, I'm not going to lie. I have a lot of them. You know what I mean? And I, 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 I think Josh has got a few, too. I always question his family because his family's, like, so perfect, but he has a few weird Weird family members. Well, every, we all do. You can't. You can't have every, everybody. Can't be a type A personality no. in the family. You've got to have a few wires to get crossed in there somewhere. <laughs> Listen, I'm a little. I think you have to be a little. I like blustered. I, I think you have to like. You know, I think you have to be a little crazy to be in this business too, though. You know, like. just a little bit. Or yeah. really, really dumb, where you're just oblivious to everything. Yeah. Which I don't choose to be. No. Yep. I just. I try to. My new motto is: first of all, I've been in this stage of just like. I'm letting God lead my life. Like, I think we all try to take too much control of things that we can't control. And um, I'm a big believer. I love the Lord. I mean, I know it doesn't seem that way based on the way that I cuss and talk sometimes. But I do unapologetically love Jesus. And I I remember earlier this year, you know, I, I think as, a, as an artist and as a type A personality, you feel like you need to take control. Like, I'm— Oh shit! I need a record deal. Oh shit! I need this. I, I'm, oh my gosh! I need to make all this happen for me. But like, when I first moved to town, I moved here with a guitar and a prayer. I didn't move here with anything more than that. And all I could do every day was bet on Jesus. And I think moving forward, you know, with my career, it's like, you know, it's really what God wants for me and what like what His plan is for me. Because when I try to control it. It never goes the way that I want it to. But when you give it up to the big man and let him take full control of your life, it really is crazy the doors that start opening. I mean, people tell you that, like, let go and let God, and you think that that's just some stupid Pinterest quote, but it really isn't. Like, you truly do. There is something about understanding that not everything is in your control, but that's a hard thing to do when you're a type A personality. But that's um, that's probably the biggest thing that I've leaned on this last year, and it's been cool because you just open yourself up to possibilities. Because, first of all, I love that um, picture. Uh, it's like a little girl holding um, a small teddy bear. And and God, you know, goes, you know, trust me. And he has a big teddy bear behind him. And she doesn't want to give it to him because, you know, it's her little teddy bear. But then right behind it, he has a big old teddy bear waiting for her. And I think that we all need to have that that perspective because that's really your big teddy bear is just right around the corner just got to wait for it and believe in it you know i'm really proud of all you're doing proud you're of your so growing sweet. family thank proud you. to call you my friend you're so sweet thank Jesse. you for giving me some time uh tell me all of your socials and all yeah. the places where people can find all of your Absolutely. music and and everything about the book and yes so uh my instagram is raylan official i think it's raylan on twitter um and then my if you go to my website you can get you know my book my merch See where I'm playing. I'm playing a lot of shows this fall that I'm really Great. excited about. So y'all come see me this fall. Um, we have some stuff booked for next year too. And we got a lot of a lot of great things on the horizon. So just be be looking out. Awesome. Raylan. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Awesome.